Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me today. We are talking about the Netflix series on Jeffrey Epstein called Filthy Rich. And you may be thinking, what are we just gonna talk about the episodes? I mean, yeah, we're gonna talk about the episodes. And for the most part, although I typically don't like these kinds of docu-series because I feel like they can be biased and they have a narrative that they're trying to spin for you, I thought this one was okay. However, as we were going through each episode, I found myself with questions. Who's this person? What role did they have? How did they know Epstein? How did they know these people? Where's the connection? And that's really what these videos are for, because as you're watching this documentary and the series, you're going to have questions and you're going to want to know more about certain things that the docu-series just either didn't want to talk about or didn't have time to go into. So really, it's going to be a discussion of each episode with, you know, how things are happening in the episode and then illuminating places where you may have had questions and kind of making those connections as we go. We're going to start with the first episode and work our way through it, and it gets crazy, guys. It, it gets insane. Every episode just gets worse. So, you know, grab a snack, grab your coffee, put your feet up, you're in for a ride. Before we get started, I'd like to have a word from our sponsor, Raycon. Raycon's mission is sharing great sound with the world, and they built this mission around the belief that everyone deserves to enjoy a great audio experience. You remember Ray J, right? Singer, songwriter, actor, and of course, Brandy's little brother. He founded the company because he was sick of premium audio being so expensive. So he got together with some audio engineers and music industry experts to create a line of wireless headphones and earbuds. What I have here are the Everyday E25 wireless earbuds. And I can tell you from experience, not only do they sound just as good as other premium audio brands, they are far more comfortable. Sometimes I like to fall asleep listening to podcasts or audiobooks, but I don't want to disturb my husband so I'll wear headphones or earbuds and it's never a comfortable experience. I can fall asleep wearing the Everyday E25 earbuds and have no issue. And they're a fraction of the price of any other premium wireless earbuds on the market right now. These ones are the latest model. They have six hours of playtime. They have different size inserts so you can find your perfect fit and they're surprisingly noise isolating. This is not a one size fits all kind of product. Not only can you switch out the inserts to make them more comfortable for your size ear, but they come in a wide variety of new and fun colors. You don't have to just choose between black and white. Now, viewers of this channel can go to buyraycon.com slash Stephanie Harlow and receive 15% off your first order. Wireless earbuds don't have to be this complicated technological experience either. And to illustrate this for you, I'm going to bring in an expert, someone who's pretty much stolen these earbuds from me since the moment they arrived. Okay, so this is my son, Aiden. He is eight years old. You've been using the Raycon Everyday E25 earbuds since they arrived. What do you what do you think about them? Um, they're really easy to connect to your tablet. Uh, they're really comfortable, and I run on the treadmill all the time with them. And I can listen to my shows, my music, and this is one of the little Raycon earbuds. It has a little button right here, and if you press it, it pauses your show or your music. And it's, they're really helpful because they're not hard to connect and they're not hard to, and they, they're really comfortable. And it, when you're running, they won't fall off. If you want to buy headphones or earbuds, I suggest you buy the Raycon earbuds. They have their own little charging case and they're, they're really comfortable to hold. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Soft. you. <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to take these to finish telling everyone about them, and then I'll give them back to you after, okay? Okay. All right, love you. See ya. See ya. So as you can see, the Raycon Everyday E25 wireless earbuds are perfect for you, your parents, your kids. I mean, Aiden's eight, and he figured out how to use them with no instruction from me whatsoever within moments. He was actually teaching me stuff about them after having used them just one time, like that thing where that he said about pausing it by touching the, the earbud. They look cool, they sound great, they're comfortable, they're more affordable than other brands out there. Click on the link in the description box and go to buyraycon.com slash Stephanie Harlow if you want to get 
15% off your order. Father's Day's coming up. I've purchased a pair for my dad, who's very old school, but loves to listen to music while he's in the barn working. Aiden is most likely stealing these ones from me, so it won't be long before I'm going back to grab myself another pair. So in the case, it literally says R and then L for right ear and left ear. So I know that this one goes in my right ear and this one goes in my left ear. And now I literally can't hear anything. Goodbye, uncomfortable, overpriced headphones. Hello, Raycon. Okay, so just to set the stage, the first episode is named The Hunting Grounds, and it starts off with Jeffrey Epstein being questioned on January 25th, 2012. He's asked what his address is, and he gives his address as 6100 Red Hook Boulevard in the Virgin Islands, and then he lists off multiple other places around the world where he has vacation homes. New Mexico, Palm Beach, New York, Paris. So the whole title of the series, Filthy Rich, is already illustrating itself less than a minute in. Now, I believe that this footage is from the court proceedings which took place after Virginia Roberts filed court papers in Florida alleging that she was forced to have sex with Prince Andrew and lawyer Alan Dershowitz while she was underage. This is when that picture of Virginia and Prince Andrew surfaced, and Epstein's friend and socialite Ghislaine Maxwell was accused of working as his madam. Maxwell, Dershowitz, and Prince Andrew all denied these allegations, of course. So Jeffrey Epstein's asked if he's ever been convicted of a crime, and he answers that yes, he has, soliciting prostitution and procuring a minor for the purposes of prostitution. But then he's asked, you know, did you actually commit these crimes? And he pleads the fifth, and this becomes a pattern. The lawyer asks, how many times have you done this in the state of Florida? And Jeffrey Epstein responds, same answer. So he doesn't even respond, I plead the fifth. He responds literally, same answer. He's asked if he's ever done it in the Virgin Islands. He says, same answer. They ask about New York, New Mexico, Paris. Mr. Epstein, have you ever done this anytime, any place? and he says same answer. So the first five minutes is setting the stage to show how Jeffrey Epstein had essentially been doing whatever he wanted to whoever he wanted, and he was protected by his rich and powerful friends. It shows that he never really did have a desire to take accountability for the things he'd done, and when asked direct questions about solicitating underage girls for prostitution, he doesn't want to answer. He can't even say no. We're then introduced to Vicki Ward, an investigative journalist who wrote a piece on Epstein for Vanity Fair in 2003. She says she knew about Epstein long before she'd been asked to write a story on him. And she'd been introduced to him as like this Gatsby-like figure of mystery in New York. What we hear from Vicki is what we've heard from a lot of other people over the years and what we hear from a lot of people in this documentary series. No one really knew what Jeffrey Epstein did. They knew he had a crap ton of money, but no one really knew how he made his money. He always had this shroud of anonymity around him. Everyone knew he was rich, he knew lots of other rich and powerful people, and he always had a lot of beautiful young women around him. One of these beautiful women being Ghislaine Maxwell, who was allegedly his girlfriend for a time. Ghislaine Maxwell has her own share of powerful and rich connections. Educated at Oxford, beautiful, smart, funny. Sustainable development goals are being voted on uh, in September 2014, and currently they are not part of the United Nations agenda. So uh, I made an, a commitment at the Clinton Global Initiative in partnership with Ambassador Beck who is the first appointed uh, United Nations ambassador to the oceans and the sea. Uh, Amir Dossal uh, from the Global Forum Partnership and an academic uh, to say that we are going to work towards getting uh, a sustainable ocean development goal. Friends in high places, family in high places, like her father, Ian Robert Maxwell, who has been described as a media giant. There's a lot of intrigue around this individual, Robert Maxwell. He's rumored to have ties to the Mossad. He died falling off his $15 million yacht named the Lady Ghislaine while in the Canary Islands. Some of his acquisitions in life included Macmillan Publishing House in New York, the Daily Mirror in Britain, the Daily Record, the European, and the British Printing and Communication Corporation, which was Britain's largest printing company. Weeks after his death, it was discovered that $460 million was missing from the pension funds of some of his companies. 
There's just a lot of shady stuff that he was involved in. And journalist Margarita Pagano once said about Maxwell, his past seems almost too exotic to be true. He claimed he was an Orthodox Jew who escaped from Czechoslovakia when the Nazis arrived during World War II. His parents and many of his family members, however, were not so lucky and ended up being sent to Auschwitz where they died. He then joined the army, led volunteers to France, and then when Paris fell, he moved to Britain, joining the British army and going on to be awarded the country's highest military medal. During all of this, he would use different assumed identities, such as Ivan du Maurier, Leslie Jones, and of course, Robert Ian Maxwell. Allegedly, he built his empire after the war by striking a deal with a German scientific publishing house for the exclusive rights to export its back and current issues. And when he died at the age of 68, he was a very well-connected man who left behind a fortune and nine children, the youngest of which is Ghislaine Maxwell. Now that's often said that, that he was very rich when he died. And I don't know about his financial standings, but it was rumored that when he died, Ghislaine Maxwell did find herself in a slightly less than financial situation than she'd been used to. When he was alive, she had access to whatever resources he had, but when he died, she was only given 80,000 pounds a year, which she would have to live on, which seems like a lot. To, to most of us, right? It seems like a lot of money. It's a little over $101,000 in the US, but that wasn't obviously what she was used to. It wasn't the, the type of money that she was used to having and being able to spend. So it's suspected that after her father died and she was in these horrible financial circumstances, she had to find somebody who had money and could provide her and keep her in that lifestyle that she had grown used to and that's when she found Jeffrey Epstein. So when the man who was the editor of Vanity Fair at this time gave Vicki Ward this assignment, it was supposed to be a society piece, not like an expose. That editor, Graydon Carter, told her that there just wasn't a lot known about this illustrious man of mystery, which is, I'm sure, exactly the way Epstein wanted it. Operate in the dark. Don't draw a lot of attention to who you are and what you're doing. That way, no one's watching. No one's asking questions. But someone like Jeffrey Epstein, who's a bit of a narcissist, to put it lightly, he couldn't really commit fully to a life in the shadows. He had to be seen with all of his famous friends, photographed with them, known to be affiliated with them, and in the end, I believe, this would eventually be his downfall. So of course, when Vicki Ward starts to look into Epstein, she's going to talk to people who know him. And this is when she saw what she called a red flag. One of her sources told her that they knew a woman who had a bad experience while working for Epstein, and that her younger, underage sister had also been abused by him, and so Pandora's box had been opened. We're now introduced to Maria Farmer, an artist who's known for filing the earliest criminal complaint to law enforcement on Jeffrey Epstein in 1996. Maria was Vicky's initial source, and her little sister Annie Farmer was also victimized. Maria tells the story in this series about how she was graduating from the New York Academy of Arts in 1995, and the Dean of Students at that time was Eileen Guggenheim. Who is Eileen Guggenheim? Well, we need to know this because she'll be important to the story, and I don't feel like Netflix really talked about her enough, at least where I'm at. I'm about halfway through the series right now, so they haven't really gone deep into what she's all about and what her part is in this. And if the name Guggenheim sounds familiar, I'm not surprised. The Guggenheim Museum in New York City is an internationally renowned art museum and one of the most significant architectural icons of the 20th century. The Guggenheim family is known for making their fortune in the mining industry in the early 20th century, especially in the U.S. and South America. After World War I, some family members withdrew from mining and began focusing on philanthropy, specifically the arts. If you watch Titanic or know your history, you would also know Benjamin Guggenheim went down with the unsinkable ship in 1912, and Cora Guggenheim married a Rothschild, a member of another rich and powerful family. And our friend Eileen here is distantly related, telling Harper's Bazaar in 2013, with a last name like Guggenheim, how can you not be an art historian? Eileen has been given accolades for years for being a trailblazer and a supporter of artists. Actress Naomi Watts and her partner Lee Schreiber were big supporters of the school and Eileen herself. 
Naomi said, quote, her passion and energy have really helped build the institution into the go-to place to establish emerging artists. Emerging artists like Maria Farmer, who entered a triptych of paintings into an art show organized by Eileen the night of her graduation from the art school. I first met Jeffrey Epstein in 1995, so I'm 25 years old. I had just graduated from the New York Academy of Art, and all the students have a show. He went to shake my hand and he said, you're so talented, I love your painting. This is the painting that Jeffrey Epstein purchased the night I met him. It was her Alice in Wonderland series, and Maria was over the moon when all three of her paintings sold almost immediately. The first sold for 14 k and the other two sold for 12 k each. When Eileen approached her at this art show, it wasn't to congratulate Maria, but to tell her that her paintings would not be going to the people who had bought them. Another couple was going to be bringing her paintings home. Her dear friends, Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. Allegedly, Eileen said, quote, They are very important benefactors to the Academy, and they're just completely delighted. And you will be selling to them, and you will be giving them a discount. So, instead of the 12 k she was supposed to get, Maria only got 6 But Jeffrey Epstein told her not to worry, because he would make it worth her while. But wait. I'm not done with Eileen yet. As of May 2020, there's a petition to remove Eileen Guggenheim from her post as chair of the school's board of trustees due to what has been called her enabling behavior in association with Jeffrey Epstein. Maria Farmer claims she told Eileen what Epstein was doing, but it was ignored. Of course, Eileen denies this. And it seems that the New York Academy of Arts was also not adverse to taking Jeffrey Epstein's money even after he became a registered sex offender in 2008. In 2012, he purchased tickets to a fundraiser for the school, and in 2014, he purchased tickets to two different fundraisers, as well as donated $30,000 out of his pocket. So Maria claimed that Jeffrey Epstein called her a few months after purchasing her art, telling her he had a job for her. He claimed he wanted her to manage the door of his new mansion on 71st Street. So she'd be responsible for like managing visitors and decorators, people who are working at the house. This incredibly talented young artist was pretty much bullied into selling her art for much less than it was worth. And then she's offered a job not as an artist, but as a glorified butler. And this is supposed to be the way that Eileen Guggenheim creates a place for emerging artists in the world? Okay. Now, what developed between Maria and Epstein after is very reminiscent of how R. Kelly would operate. He began questioning her about her life, her family, asking how many siblings she had, what their names were, how old they were, etc. And Maria told him about her 16-year-old sister, Annie, who lived in Arizona and who had dreams of going to an Ivy League college. And of course, out of the goodness of his little black heart, Jeffrey Epstein wanted to help Annie. Epstein told Annie that she'd be well-served by going on some international trips to build up her resume. It would look good when applying to colleges, and he said he would pay for it. And Annie remembered feeling so grateful that this stranger would be interested and invested enough in her life and her future to pay for expensive trips like that. The trip was planned for the summer in July, and Epstein invited Annie to visit his ranch in New Mexico, where she could meet him and his girlfriend, Ghislaine Maxwell. Now, Annie's mother was under the impression that this visit would be a chance for Annie, as well as other students and young people, to get together and meet before they all went on their respective international trips. But when Annie arrived, she saw there were no other students. It was just her, Ghislaine Maxwell, and Jeffrey Epstein, and she said that Ghislaine and Epstein took her around the property in what she describes as a way to show off what they had. She said, quote, it was part of building up this sense of like, look who I am, look at all that I have, be impressed by me. So Annie says, you know, she gets there, they're showing her around, they're showing off, and then all of a sudden it jumps to Ghislaine asking Annie whether she's ever had a professional massage before. This is such a strange avenue of conversation to go down when you first met somebody, by the way, in my opinion, and they're 16 years old. Annie's probably thinking, you know, these people are rich. They probably get professional massages every day. They probably have like a professional masseur on staff. 
although it seems like a bizarre thing to talk about, they live a different kind of lifestyle. So Annie most likely was taken aback by this conversation, but kind of rationalized it as they just live a, a different life that I don't live. So this might be normal to them. So then Ghislaine tells her that Annie's going to have a massage and she's so lucky to have this opportunity. She brings her to this room with a massage table, tells her to get undressed and get under the sheet on the table. But then it turns out Ghislaine is the one giving her this massage and she does so with all the doors open in the room. At times, having Annie lay on her back and pulling the sheet down so that she was exposed. And Annie said she knew, due to the doors being open and the layout of the house, Jeffrey Epstein could see everything. And this was just one of the bizarre and inappropriate things that happened to her while she stayed with Epstein that weekend. She claimed that the scariest thing that happened to her that weekend was when Jeffrey Epstein came into her bedroom one morning saying he wanted to cuddle. He got into bed with her and began touching her until she told him that she had to go to the bathroom. Scared, she went into the bathroom, locked the door, and then tried to push the events of this awkward weekend out of her mind. She didn't tell anyone what had happened, and she went to Thailand and Vietnam that summer hoping she'd imagined things or she was blowing things out of proportion. While Annie was overseas, Maria got a call from Epstein offering her an artist in residency in Ohio, living in a 2,600 square foot home behind Les Wexner. Who is Les Wexner? Well, Les Wexner is a billionaire businessman, the founder of L Brands, which has brought you some of capitalism's greatest hits, the limited Victoria's Secret, Abercrombie and Fitch, Express, Bath and Body Works. He and his mother were the first people to make a million dollar donation to the United Way in 1989, and his name is inscribed in marble in the lobby of the United Way headquarters. His relationship with Epstein allegedly began in the 1980s when Epstein became his financial manager in 1987. They were tight. I mean, they must have been because Les Wexner bought the Herbert N. Strauss house in 1989 and in the 90s, he transferred it to Epstein's name with what seems to be no exchange of money. So he just gifted this ginormous over $70 million house to Jeffrey Epstein. So this house is a French neoclassical townhouse at 9 East 71st Street in one of the most fashionable blocks on the Upper East Side. A Town & Country article stated, For reasons that have never been explained, Wexner appears to have made a gift of the house to Epstein, transferring title for the cost of zero around 1996. This house is seven stories tall and people who visited Epstein after he took over the house and decorated it in his own taste described chairs upholstered in leopard print, a twice life-sized sculpture of a naked African warrior, and a framed picture of a woman holding an opium pipe and caressing a lion skin. There was like a lot of artwork that had insinuated nudity with regard women and I remember suggestive. Very suggestive. We had like a bathtub that was kind of like opened and there was prosthetic breasts that he could play with while he was taking a, yeah, a bath. In what seems to be a stark contrast in his art tastes, which are admittedly quite strange, he would have photographs of all his famous friends displayed. Woody Allen, Bill Clinton, and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salam of Saudi Arabia. The Times also reported a life-sized female doll hanging from a chandelier. A publicist who visited Epstein at the house told Town & Country that he has a mural on the terrace, the whole length of the building of a prison yard with barbed wire and guard towers. The inmates are out exercising, and he pointed to one and said, that's me. That's to remind myself that I could go back there. If only he knew that he could go back there. In fact, he would go back there, but he wouldn't be there for long. But back to Les Wexner. So not only does he give Jeffrey Epstein this incredibly expensive house in New York City for seemingly no reason at all, but in 1991, he granted Epstein power of attorney and also made him a trustee on the board of the Wexner Foundation, not even batting an eye when L Brand executives told him Epstein was abusing his power by pretending to be a Victoria's Secret recruiter. So when Maria asked Jeffrey Epstein who Les Wexner was, Epstein said that Les Wexner was his client and very good friend who also happened to be a billionaire, and he said, quote, he would do anything for me. 
While Maria was staying on the Wexner's property, she focused on painting and creating new art, and a lot of her stuff was kind of designed around this coming-of-age story for a young girl, and she'd paint from photographs. The photographs that she used were of her two younger sisters who had modeled for her. Annie, who was 16 at the time, and their younger sister, who was only 12. So Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein came to visit while Maria was there, and as soon as they arrived, Ghislaine let Maria know that Jeffrey would like to have his feet rubbed that night. Now Maria obviously thinks this is a bizarre request, and it makes her uncomfortable, but at the same time, she's thinking, you know, I have these people to thank for living in this mansion and being able to work on my art all day. She said she didn't want them to think she was ungrateful, so she goes into their bedroom that night and she starts rubbing his feet, and then he tells her to come and sit next to him on the bed, you know, he's like patting the bed next to him, which she does, but then Ghislaine comes and sits on the other side of her. So Maria's like wedged in between Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell on the bed, and they both put their arms around her and start touching her, and she feels uncomfortable with that, obviously. So she gets up, she runs out of the room, into her room, and she claims she barricaded herself in until they left the next morning. Now the next day, after they left, she went into her studio to get back to her paintings, and she noticed that three of the pictures she used to paint from, the pictures of her little sisters, they were gone. She called her sister Annie, remembering that Annie had spent some time at Epstein's ranch in New Mexico. And Maria asked Annie, you know, this is what happened to me. Has anything strange like that happened to you while you were with Jeffrey Epstein? And Annie told her sister that she had experienced much of the same, but she didn't really want to talk about it. That same day, Jeffrey Epstein called Maria, and he's trying to play it cool, you know, just small talk. He's like, oh, I had a really great time last night. You know, obviously trying to feel her out to see if she's going to be a problem for him. And Maria told Epstein what had happened the night before. It wasn't okay. And his tone kind of changed after that. You know, he became all business, basically asking her, what do you want? How much is it going to take for you to stay quiet about all of this? And then at that point, she claims she hung up on him. So when Maria gets back to the city, she goes to the NYPD and she tells them what happened to her and what happened to Annie. And they basically told her, this isn't our jurisdiction. This stuff happened in Ohio, in New Mexico. We can't do anything about it. You have to go to the FBI. Maria did go to the FBI. She talked to an agent there and she said it seemed like he believed her and he was taking these accusations seriously but then nothing ever happened. After that, they never heard back from the FBI. So by the time Vanity Fair reporter Vicky found Maria and Annie in 2003, they were not really willing to tell their story because they'd already tried that and no one had helped them or listened to them. They felt that Epstein was too rich, too powerful, too connected to be taken down, but eventually they did get together as a family and they made a decision to talk to Vicky and bring Epstein's crimes out into the open. Now, this is something I really didn't know before watching this docu-series, but when a journalist is writing a piece on someone, especially a high-profile someone, they'll typically have to send it to that person before it gets published. This gives the subject of the piece a chance to give their comments or tell their side of the story, to deny or refute, etc. And Epstein denied everything. He told her a very different story. He claimed that Maria and Annie were obsessed with him, in love with him, and he rejected them, so all of this was just their way of getting revenge. But that's not all he did. He subtly, or not so subtly, threatened Vicky, saying, well, Vicky, if I don't like this piece, it's going to be bad for you and your family. Now, Vicky was currently pregnant, with twins at this time, and Epstein asks her, what hospital are you planning to give birth in? And when she didn't answer, he said, I know all the doctors in all the hospitals, so it doesn't matter if you don't tell me, I'll find you. I'm going to have a witch doctor place a curse on your unborn children. At this point, it really hit home for Vicky, just a fraction of the fear and terror that Maria and Annie had felt trapped in a house with Jeffrey Epstein alone. And Vicky wasn't the only one who got threatened because the very same person who had assigned her the story on Jeffrey Epstein, Graydon Carter, 
called her to tell her he'd found the severed head of a cat in his garden and a bullet had been left on his front porch. It wasn't long before Graydon Carter called Vicky and said that her story would not include the allegations against Jeffrey Epstein from Maria and Annie, and he said that he believed Epstein. Now, the Vanity Fair article was published and it was titled The Talented Mr. Epstein, kind of a play on the talented Mr. Ripley which is very prophetic if you think about it, because the plot of the movie, The Talented Mr. Ripley, and I think it was a book before it was a movie, but it's Mad Damon, and he plays this musician named Tom Ripley, and he's wearing this Princeton coat. He borrowed it, and he gets approached by this older man who's a shipping magnate, and he's rich and powerful, and this guy says to Mad Damon as Tom Ripley, like, oh, I think you know my son. You went to school with my son at Princeton. And he's like, run away to Italy, and I would really like your help to go to Italy and convince him as an old friend from school to come back home, and I'll pay for your travel and everything. So Tom Ripley goes to Italy, and in the airport, he meets a woman played by Kate Blanchett. She's a socialite, you know, rich, kind of like Elaine Maxwell, and he pretends to be Dicky, who was actually the kid that he was there to convince to go home. And, and the whole point is he's pretending to be somebody he's not the whole time. Then he eventually ends up befriending the kid that he's there to bring back. He's like impressed by his lifestyle and he pretends to be somebody he's not. He pretends to be a part of that world when he's not a part of that world. And they believe him and they fall for it. And everybody just accepts him and thinks that he's one of them when he's not. And that's pretty much exactly what happened with Jeff Epstein. So I just think that it was very funny that they titled the, the piece that. However, the piece that Vicky wrote was not well printed. Every trace of Jeffrey Epstein's wrongdoings and predatory acts were edited out. And Vicky believes that Vanity Fair somehow got paid off to bury the story and look the other way. Once Vicky came forward and voiced these concerns, Graydon Carter made an official statement saying, quote, Miss Ward's reporting on this aspect of her story came as we were going to press and simply did not meet our legal threshold. In the end, we didn't have confidence in Ward's reporting. We were not in the habit of running away from a fight, but we simply didn't have the goods. And this is gaslighting. You know, he's, he's trying to make it seem like what she's saying isn't true. It wasn't that we buried the story. It was that she didn't do her job properly, so we couldn't in good faith print that story. It may seem like a huge conspiracy theory to you that a big publication like Vanity Fair would be so quick to cover up the depraved acts of an individual. They are the media after all, right? It's their job to report facts and inform the public of what's going on. Well, to get to the bottom of this, let's examine Graydon Carter a little further. In July of 2019, Hollywood reporter journalist Kim Masters spoke out saying she believed Vicky's version of events because it had happened to her as well when she was working at Vanity Fair under Graydon Carter. She'd been a contributing editor on the magazine in the 90s, and she felt that Carter would specifically assign stories to journalists based on what his famous friends wanted printed, and he would omit things from stories as well, based on what his famous friends didn't want printed. It seems that Graydon Carter had some personal and professional ties to Hollywood, many of which were financially beneficial to him. The New York Times reported that in 2003, Graydon Carter was paid $100,000 for suggesting the idea that became the Oscar-winning film A Beautiful Mind. He was also a producer on a Barry Diller bankrolled documentary about producer Robert Evans called The Kid Stays in the Picture. He also had producing credits on a 9-11 documentary and a small acting part in a Paramount Studios picture. This New York Times piece says, quote, At one time, Vanity Fair was among the few glossy publications that carried investigative articles about the entertainment industry. But by the mid-90s, some at Vanity Fair felt that Mr. Carter had been seduced by the entertainment machine he once skewered. Kim gave a few examples of this biased reporting. Graydon Carter had requested her to do a story on a struggling chain of restaurants called Planet Hollywood. She kept saying she didn't want to cover it, but eventually gave in and agreed to look into it. While looking into it, she realized 
that whatever story she would write would not be positive for a man named Jake Bloom, an entertainment lawyer and a close friend of Graydon Carter's. If I understand correctly, it seems Bloom had been given some stock in the franchise, and he'd convinced some of his high-profile clients like Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger to also invest and buy stock in Planet Hollywood. When the stock prices plummeted, these people lost a lot of money. But Jake Bloom seemed to be doing well as he was building a $15 million mansion near Sun Valley, Idaho. Now, Kim theorized that one of Bloom's clients who had lost money in the deal had urged Carter to assign the Planet Hollywood story to someone, but there was something about Bloom's house that he was building that seemed to be a pressure point for him. Remember, these people get to see the stories before they're published, and when Jake Bloom read it, he contacted Kim and told her that she could absolutely not talk about his house in the story because there was a vicious and armed group of anti-Semites who lived in his neighborhood, and if they found out he was going to be living there, his life would be in danger. Kim Masters said, the more insistent he was that she not write about the house, the more she wanted to make sure it was included in the piece until she got a call from someone who worked under Graydon Carter and this person told her the story was too long, some parts didn't fit, so they were taking out the portion about Bloom's house. Kim offered up some other bits that could be removed to improve the length, but it was pretty clear that it was the parts about his house they wanted to keep out. Another example was when Graydon Carter asked her to do a story on Mike Myers, you know, Austin Powers. One of the producers of A Beautiful Mind, Brian Grazer, seemed to have had a falling out with Myers over a plan for a movie based on Mike Myers' SNL character, Dieter. Now, Kim couldn't remember if it had been Graydon Carter himself or another editor, but someone told her that Brian Grazer had specifically requested Carter to assign the Mike Myers story to someone. At this time, Mike Myers wasn't the most popular or well-liked person in Hollywood, and Kim knew no matter what story went to press, it wouldn't reflect positively on him, since all the sources she spoke to would have nothing nice to say. Once again, the subject of the story gets to read the story before it goes public, and allegedly, what she wrote about him made Mike Myers cry. Kim Masters had it on good authority from multiple reliable sources that Paramount Pictures had discovered just weeks before shooting Wayne's World 2 that the script for the movie, which Mike Myers had written, was a little too close to another movie, a 1940s British comedy. Her sources told her that there was an emergency meeting called and Mike Myers had been confronted and told to rewrite the script immediately. So she's basically talked into doing a piece on Mike Myers because somebody in Hollywood's mad and wants him exposed, right? She does the piece and exposes him and she puts what she learned about the Wayne's World 2 script into the piece but then within no time, Mike Myers had called Graydon Carter, and when Kim's piece was published, it stated that Myers had not stolen the material, but he'd been told by a producer that the rights had been obtained and he was good to go. In regards to this, Kim said, quote, Not one person had told me that, but that's the way it read. In the end, the piece still wasn't positive, but it was no longer accurate. Some of my sources felt betrayed. It was not just embarrassing, it was damaging to me. So essentially and allegedly, what I'm getting from this is Graydon Carter pretty much worked for anyone who had enough money and enough clout to bury a story or bring it to the light. And the story of Jeffrey Epstein, ultimately, is one of the abuse of power and money. How there are certain rules for the majority of us in a completely different set for those who live in a certain tax bracket. It's not a reality that we didn't already know, but still, hearing specific examples makes you really wonder. Can you trust anything that's printed or said in the mainstream media? Many newspapers and media outlets are owned by individuals with individual agendas and specific narratives they'd like pushed. Does unbiased reporting even exist anymore? Not in mainstream media, if you want to know my opinion. Let's travel to the island of Palm Beach in Florida. Jeffrey Epstein purchased his ginormous Palm Beach house in 1990. Now, Palm Beach is a very insular community, sort of like a world of its own. And the people who live there are very wealthy. There's literally a street called Billionaire's Row. Palm Beach is an island connected to West Palm Beach by a bridge, and it's home to everyone from Bill Gates to Donald Trump, and of course, our good buddy, Jeffrey Epstein, who lived in a $20 million house there. 
James Patterson, the well-known writer, was Epstein's neighbor and eventually would co-write a book about him, exposing him, the book that was the inspiration for this Netflix series. Patterson echoed the same sentiments about Epstein that we've heard over and over again. There was very little known about him besides the fact that he was extremely wealthy and he had properties in several cities around the world, as well as a helicopter and two airplanes, one being a Boeing 727. However, it is a pretty tight-knit community over there in Palm Beach. And Epstein was new money. He didn't have roots there. His family hadn't been there for generations. So, of course, rumors would begin to circulate that something odd was going on at that house of his. Michael Ryder, the Palm Beach police chief from 2001 to 2009, met Epstein once when the millionaire walked into his office in 2001 and offered to donate $100,000 worth of equipment to the police department. In my opinion, this was preemptive hush money. He was basically saying, I know I'm doing things that are illegal. I know people are probably going to figure that out soon, and I'll be in the hot seat. So when that happens, remember how generous I was to the police department. But that's just my opinion. It wasn't until two years later, in 2003, when the police began to receive certain calls and complaints from people in Jeff Epstein's neighborhood saying they saw lots and lots of women going in and out of there all the time. Officers were dispatched to detain the women going in and to question them. Allegedly, they spoke to three or four women and all of them were of age and claimed to be doing clerical work for Mr. Epstein. At that point, it didn't seem to be a police matter and they dropped it. However, two years later in 2005, a woman called the police station claiming that her 14-year-old stepdaughter had gotten into a fight at school and it was discovered that this 14-year-old girl was in possession of $300. When the girl was asked where she got the money from, she claimed that she and her friend would go to some old rich guy's house in Palm Beach to give him massages and if he thought they were pretty enough or he liked them enough, he would keep them around for other things. Now this young girl was brought into the police station and interviewed and they found her story credible so they began to investigate which led them to Jeffrey Epstein's home. At this point it was assigned to a special investigative unit because of the nature of the crime but also because Epstein was a high profile person. Joe Riccari was the lead investigator and he found himself questioning these young girls, victims of Epstein, and they would give him the names of other young girls that had also been at the house and who were also victims of Jeffrey Epstein. These girls, who are now women, who participated in the Netflix series pretty much had the same story to tell. They would usually be approached by another girl at school offering an opportunity to make some extra money. They would cross the bridge into the Emerald City of Palm Beach and arrive at Epstein's house positively dazzled by the luxury and the opulence. They'd be greeted by other girls there, they'd be brought in through a side door, and taken to a room where there was a massage table. When they would initially come into the room, Epstein would usually be there, already, on the massage table and under a sheet, and he'd be talking on the phone because he has to show how important he is, how busy he is, what a super relevant, important person he is. He would tell the girls where the lotions were and then he'd ask them to start at his feet and move up to his legs while he was laying on his stomach. Eventually, he'd flip over on his back, take the sheet off, compliment the girls, tell them they were pretty, special, etc., and then begin to touch himself and them. He'd ask them to remove their clothes. Afterwards, he would give them $200 and he'd also have $100 for the girl who brought them there or recruited them because let's call it what it is. It was a weird, depraved sex cult pyramid scheme and he had dozens of girls in his downline. Sometimes it would end in intercourse. Sometimes he would just take care of himself while he made them stand there and watch. Michelle Licata, who was 16 when she was brought to Epstein's house for the first time, remembers driving over with her friend and before they went inside, her friend said to her, you know, if anyone asks, you're over the age of 18 but I don't think anyone is going to ask. Michelle also remembers being greeted by some women who looked like supermodels, and she said that there were adults all over the property. Some of them were employees, a guy doing the gardening, etc. Some of them just seemed to be hanging out, laying by the pool, but none of them even looked up. 
And she said it was like no one even cared that there were these young girls being walked into the back of this old man's mansion. Michelle said before Epstein started his creepy repertoire with her in the room, he told her that she was beautiful. And for a moment that felt good because she'd never seen herself as that beautiful girl. You know, she had braces, she was kind of nerdy, nobody really looked twice at her at school, so it made her feel good. But then he started touching her and telling her to take off her clothes, and she panicked. She was alone in this house with a stranger, literally on an island. She didn't know what to do, and she was afraid that if she tried to leave, he would stop her or hurt her. She said that as a young girl, when an adult tells you to do something, you just do it. You're brought up to listen, not ask questions, to trust adults. Afterwards, Michelle felt used. She felt like she was a dirty person. She said, quote, I put on my sunglasses and cried all the way home. I was just thinking, I'm never going to let anybody touch me again. I don't want anybody to look at me. I don't want anybody to touch me. The part where I felt my heart just breaking for this girl was when she started to explain who she was before Jeffrey Epstein came into her life. And then as she's trying to explain this, she just breaks down crying. And she says, I was something else. The way I saw myself a long time ago, I was like a flower, a flower that was opening up. And afterwards, it was like someone just picked up that flower, plucked it from its roots, and stomped on it and smashed it. Now, it is believed that Jeffrey Epstein purposely targeted girls from West Palm Beach because of their circumstances. It's mainly a working class community where the island of Palm Beach is the Emerald City, West Palm Beach is Kansas. You know, it's the real world where parents worry about paying their electric bill or making the rent on time, where it's not uncommon for people to have more than one job and are stretched too thin. And maybe they have their own problems with substance abuse or domestic abuse. Maybe they're just wrapped up in trying to survive. They aren't paying as much attention to what their children are up to. The girls who came from these circumstances would have been dazzled by the life that Jeffrey Epstein lived. Janae Lisa Jones, who was just 14 when she first met Epstein, said, quote, Being in such an expensive house and just where he lived in general showed you that he was above us already. It made me feel like if I would have told someone, they weren't going to believe me. Spencer Kevin, the attorney for one of the victims, said, quote, They couldn't have been more separate and different from the world of Palm Beach. They are living in trailer parks. Some of them have never even been to the island. I think if they were the daughters of bankers and lawyers and doctors of Palm Beach, this would never have occurred. One of Epstein's victims, Shauna Rivera, had already come across difficult circumstances before Jeffrey Epstein had brought more dark clouds to her sky. She came from a troubled home. Her mother was a drug addict and her father went to prison when she was just three. He got out when she was 10 and remarried, but then she had to witness her father and her stepmother beat their son to death when she was 12. She ran away from home and lived for some time in a shelter before going to live with her grandmother. When her friend told her about a guy who would pay her $200 for a 45 minute massage, she thought it was a great opportunity $200 was a lot of money to her, and Palm Beach was a place like she'd never seen before. She and her friend both went into the room with Epstein, and she said that she thought he was rude at first because he was on the phone, and then her friend told her that they needed to take their clothes off, and then her friend bounced. Her friend just bounced, left her alone in that room with this man. Jeffrey Epstein requested that Shauna rub lotion on his chest, and squeeze and pinch his nipples as hard as she could. <sighs> After he finished, he told her to get dressed and take her money, but later she got a call at home telling her to be ready because they were sending a cab to pick her up and bring her back to Jeffrey Epstein's house. She didn't have any money, and the money that was being offered to her was appealing, and she told herself that she would just try to get through it, get her cash, and go home. She did get through it and go home, but she would continue to be summoned back for another three to four years after. So all of these girls, right, they're opening up, they're finally telling the truth about what happened to them, and the police, they are investigating this. So they track down employees of Epstein to question them. Surprise, surprise, no one wants to talk, right? They all like, no, we don't want to get involved. They're afraid of getting in trouble, being sued by Jeffrey Epstein. One of them, however, did say 
that Epstein kept a list of his favorite female personnel that he liked to get massages from the most. But the same employee said, you know, I don't know what happened behind closed doors. It was just my job to keep it discreet. Enablers, all of them, all of these people who worked for Jeffrey Epstein, don't act like they didn't know what was going on. They all knew what was going on. 100%, I completely believe that, allegedly, is what I believe. All of the people who were there hanging out at the pool and, you know, greeting these girls and watching these young girls go into his house, they all knew what was happening. They're all enablers and, in my opinion, just as guilty as Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. So the police still had this investigation going, and when they realized that Epstein's employees weren't going to talk, they went through his garbage. And they found a high school report card from one of the victims as well as a note with written instructions to send flowers to a high school girl who was part of her school's performance and to present them to her on the stage after the show. <laughs> the high schools of West Palm Beach were Epstein's hunting grounds in an almost identical way to R. Kelly. R. Kelly would send his underlings to, you know, these high schools. He'd hang out at McDonald's where all the high school kids would hang out after school. Both Epstein and R. Kelly would send their people who worked for them to find these young, vulnerable girls who were in need, who would have a hard time turning down money, and he would abuse them. I mean, this guy was loaded, and it's reported that he needed to have a massage twice a day, every day. If it was really about getting a massage, Epstein had enough money where he could literally hire a licensed massage therapist and have them on call night and day. But instead, he wanted underage girls who have no training in massage therapy trapped alone with him in a room on an island where they don't know anyone, where they're brought in on the false pretenses of a friend who's telling them that this guy's just going to help you earn some extra money. It's twisted. It's so twisted. And like I said, most of these girls had almost identical experiences, except for one, Haley Robson. She was also recruited by a friend from school, and when she heard about the opportunity to make the money, she thought this was her way out of West Palm Beach. Haley talked about the art she saw displayed in Epstein's house as she walked through, a lot of nudity and one picture of kids, which she says wasn't normal. And although Epstein tried to pull the same song and dance with her, she told him, it wasn't going to happen, and his demeanor changed once again to all business. He was like, okay, okay, you don't want to take off your clothes and massage me. I get it, I get it, but here, I have another proposition for you. He said, listen, I'll pay you $100 for every one of your friends that you bring here. He was paying her a finder's fee, essentially, for luring other underage girls to his house, and she did this for him for a year. She estimates that she recruited about 24 girls for Epstein and those girls brought in other girls and so on and so forth. And when the police asked her how many of these girls were under the age of 18, she answered all of them. She'd bring the girls to the house, take them to the room, and then she'd leave, waiting by the pool until Epstein came out, making some small talk with her, asking how she's doing, asking about her family trying to make it seem like he cared about her, like he gave a shit about her life, when in reality, all he cared about was what she could provide him with, how many girls she could lure to his house for him. So in a 2005 conversation with police, Haley Robson compared herself to Hollywood Madam Heidi Fleiss. At the time, Robson denied that she did anything wrong. She insisted that the girls who were willing to come to Epstein's house didn't need any convincing. Robson also told police that Epstein had instructed her the younger the better and that she'd offered to bring over a 23-year-old woman and Epstein said that woman was too old. The other girls Robson recruited were between the ages of 14 and 16 at the time. Honestly, I'm conflicted on how I feel about Haley's story and her her part in luring other young women to that house of horrors. It feels to me as if these girls who turned him down and, you know, didn't want to be victimized by him were kind of throwing their friends to the wolves in order to save themselves. But is Haley any less of a victim than the other girls? I mean, that's not really for me to say. She was only 17 at the time. So... You know, she was still young. She was underage. In the state of Florida, she's still under the age of consent. 
But the last girl that she brought to Epstein, who's just identified as SG in the affidavit, because she's 14 years old, so they're not going to give her real name, that girl told police that Haley Robson was her boyfriend's cousin. So it's really difficult to say what any one of us would have done in, in Haley's shoes. It's split down the middle as to how much of a victim people think Haley is. But I'm just going to sit here and say that she was a victim. Did she make some bad choices? Did she participate in this when she probably shouldn't have? Yes. But you have to remember, Jeffrey Epstein was incredibly manipulative, calculated, and smart when it came to his MLM. He sold these girls a bill of goods. He promised them a better life. He groomed them into thinking what he was doing wasn't wrong or weird. It's just a massage, right? You aren't bringing your friends here to be killed or anything. They can just say no, like you did, right? There's nothing to feel guilty about. They have free will and a choice. He would gaslight these girls. And this is a clearly important man who has a lot of money. He's been successful. He has friends in high places. He can't be that bad, after all. How would he get this far in life if he was this horrible, terrible person? It's really tough to know exactly what these girls were thinking in that moment. But he did target these girls that came from disadvantaged circumstances purposely so that they would be dazzled by his money and his power and his house and pictures of him with presidents in his living room. He knew exactly what he was doing. And in the next video, when we talk about the second episode, you'll see that it took him years to perfect this, to get it just right. Unless you guys don't want me to do another one of these videos on episode two. So let me know if you do. If you don't want any more and, you know, this is boring for you or you just feel like I'm uh, repeating things you already know, then let me know that in the comments. But if you want, I can make a video on every episode and kind of get deeper and go into the places that Netflix kind of shaded over or didn't talk about too much. So let me know what you guys think about that. If you want more of these videos on Jeffrey Epstein kind of going over the Filthy Rich series and what was kind of left out and what I wanted to know more about. I mean, I started this channel because I would watch documentaries or I would hear these stories about these crimes and I would have so many questions that I would have to look into things further and I'd be like, why wouldn't they add this in the documentary? Like, it's so interesting. So that's definitely how my brain works. But if you guys don't like it, let me know. Um, but if you want to see more, let me know as well. Tell me what you think about this guy, this guy, Jeffrey Epstein, in the comments. Let me know what you think about all of the people that we've talked about so far who have enabled him. Allegedly, in my opinion, Graydon Carter, right? Editor of Vanity Fair. Eileen Guggenheim. Don't even get me started. Ghislaine Maxwell, her father probably, all the people who worked for him, all his buddies. Oh, it gets, it gets worse, guys. It gets worse. Uh, there's a lot to unpack here. So let me know what you think. But that's all I have for this one. Until next time, stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and I'll see you soon. I got